course, seven courses, three courses, or by the next semester. Survive on uh, Friday with Corey and uh, work okay. <laughs> yeah. Corey needs to work on his board work. Section 5 of Fourier Transform. Uh, there is this other section in the notes called Section 4, which is titled A Review of Calculus, which really means a review of analysis 2. Uh, so most of the notes in the in Section 4 is stuff that you guys should be fairly familiar with. Uh, maybe the very last section is about uh, integrating on surfaces and doing change of variables on surfaces, and maybe I'm not sure you've seen that or not. But the main part of it just covers. Uh, basic facts like the bounded monotone dominated convergence theorem for integration in RN. Uh, theorem that tells you when you can differentiate underneath an integration sign, uh, and some other minor bits and pieces. So I'm not going to spend any lecture time on section four. Please read it and make sure that you remember what's going on there and complain when we get to things later on that are from there that we've forgotten to talk about. Um, okay. So what is Fourier transform about? Um, so this is sort of the beginning of a, of a whole giant topic called harmonic analysis, which um, lots of people here in the department do, uh, and is very strong in Australia generally. Uh, we're, I mean, we're just doing the beginning of, of the Fourier transform, so we're doing the harmonic analysis on our end, but the subject goes in lots of different directions, in particular uh, study harmonic analysis on other groups, RN is a group just under addition of vectors. Uh, harmonic analysis is sort of the generalization of the Fourier transform to B groups and other things. Okay. Uh, maybe actually on, on the subject of, uh, of Australia being strong in harmonic analysis, I would encourage you not to listen to me and read the lecture notes here, uh, but instead at some point uh, to Google Terry Tao uh, the Fourier transform. Where you'll find uh, a 
strange thing to this sort of accommodation blog post course. Um, I think it's basically a course he taught at UCLA that he then sort of wrote up, uh, but that you can find on his blog. But in particular, section two, uh, it's really beautiful. Uh, it's, 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 it's section two. You might find that the whole thing, sections one and two are somehow a little bit hard going. He talks about locally compatibility groups, and it's all a little, a little bit more abstract. But section two comes back, back down to earth, and basically covers exactly the same content that we're just doing for the next week or two, but much, much better than I will ever manage to do. So quite seriously, read this, <coughs> and uh, see what a terrible job to make a comparison. Uh, Terry Tower is uniformly a beautiful writer. And more generally, if you care about analysis and want to learn about analysis, just read every single thing on his blog for the last 10 years. It's probably the best use of your life. Okay. <laughs> so let's uh, give my attention. So let's just remember some stuff about Fourier series. So say we've got uh, some function uh, defined on the real line, and we can uh, define its Fourier coefficients. Well, actually, sorry, maybe. Uh, let's do uh, not functions on the real line, but functions on some curved interval. Ultimate. So we can define the Fourier uh, coefficients as beautiful over that interval. Complex exponential multiplied by a function, and then ending there, telling us how quickly that complex exponential is, is going around. And uh, when you do this, you get uh, two beautiful facts. First of all, uh, uh, these Fourier coefficients. Well, this fact here, of A is telling you that this, these Fn's were a sequence in little, little, little L2 there. Okay, it's a square sum of all sequence. It's calculated by that quantity. And so, uh, so this converges. The basic point now is to attempt to uh, do a continuous version of, of Fourier series. And basically, what we're going to be doing is letting the L go to infinity. And, uh, and instead of having an infinity parameter here, we're going to have a continuous parameter for parameterizing our coefficients. But just to make life a little bit easier in what follows, uh, because these formulas all depended on, on L. I'm going to go through and put in an extra subscript on the Fn's. Yeah, so we'll call them. If we're working on the interval minus L to L, let's uh, talk about the coefficients F subscript N common L. Okay, just to keep track of what we're doing. So, what I want to do is think of these. It's free of coefficients. So. 
to prove if I, if I had some fixed function f, maybe I should be writing from the L and all of these, so just prompt that I do that. Okay. So in fact, now I've got some fixed function f that's maybe defined on the whole real line, but I'm still defining these f and l's just by integrating from negative l to l. Now I'll think about what might happen to this picture as we let l go to infinity. Okay? So we're going to be defining some function that's defined on this denser and denser lattice as L gets big, higher, and L is getting small. And so we're filling in more and more of the values, and our hope is that this converges to some continuous function defined everywhere. So maybe it's a little bit unclear what exactly I'd want to mean by converge, because um, we're talking about functions with different domains even at this point. Okay. So the, let's just sort of see uh, what this would look like. Just, uh, we're just we're now we're, we're now just pretending that things work and seeing how things go. Okay? So if we had this, the idea would be that f hat at some point is i. Well, it should be some limit as all goes to infinity of, uh, so maybe let me define, the, think of this function here, let's call this f hat subscript of this function that's only defined on the lattice, not defined. Since a bunch of people just came in late then, naughty, 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 let me just very quickly say what's going on. Uh, read this, don't listen to me. Terry explains Fourier transforms much better than I ever will. Uh, this is what Fourier series look like, given a function f to describe Fourier coefficients. Uh, their norms are L2 simple <coughs> and sum up to the L2 norm of the function that you had before, and you can reconstruct the function from its Fourier coefficients. And the goal now is to try and imagine uh, what a continuous version of that theory might be. So we're thinking about these functions to find this lattice and trying to let our algorithm get okay. So what would we get here? Well, we're meant to be taking some uh, some limit of these f hat subscript l's, but I mean this only makes sense uh, if xi is actually a point in where you can actually even talk about this function. So let's uh, say we're looking at some point xi. It looks like n pi over L. Now this is a little bit strange already. Uh, well, okay. uh, what would that be? Well, of course, uh, this f hat L at n pi over L is just a limit as L goes to infinity of uh, what we're going to do. It's f uh, f hat n comma L. Now this is going to be defined in this function just by the Fourier coefficients. And then and what's L according to this formula? N better than L xi over pi common L. Okay. So this is you can see why I'm a little bit something sketchy going on here. Uh, this quantity doesn't make sense at all values of L because this first number is meant to be integer. Okay? So this only makes, we're taking this limit as L goes to infinity, but kind of only along those discrete points L where this function has to be integer. Okay. But then we just plug in the formula at that point for what the Fourier coefficient x is. Integer L uh, infinity. So this is some kind of integral. So n, L xi over pi, uh, then we need another pi, then we need an x divided by L, uh, and then we have the x dx, and then simplify those pi's 
going to hopefully use this limit here. Okay. Now, I should have put all of these sort of equals at this point in quotes. It was all a bit fishy what we were doing, thinking about these functions. It wanted to find every way we're taking limits anyway. What's f hat l? F, uh, where, where am I going? Uh, here, yeah, so f hat l is this function. So, so f hat l is this function that's only defined in this lattice, pi over l models of integers to the complex numbers. Okay, now this last thing that we've written is awesome. And that's uh, what we're going to define as the Fourier transform of f. It is some function to, again, evaluated at xi. Okay? And so what we're now going to do is not worry about any of this sort of derivation, which was sort of bullshit anyway, and just look at this, this formula for some new function. It's a function of xi depending on our original function f, and just see what we can prove about this new quantity called the Fourier transform. And it's going to turn out that basically everything wonderful that you could possibly want from it is true. Uh, let's come back and look at these formulas and just try and guess the theorems that we're meant to prove, and then we'll spend the rest of today proving them. Um, well, I guess the rest of the week proving them. So, uh, let's see. Use our uh, well, um, what I, just, I just want to look at <coughs> these formulas here and sort of imagine what they look like taking L to infinity without worrying at all about what it actually means to do that. So if we take this left hand side here, uh, left hand side. Okay, what is that? Well, some pies and take away some pies to make life much better. Okay. Uh, okay. So all that I'm doing here is just saying like this is how we define these funny f hat subscript L functions that are just the Fourier coefficients. But now what's this quantity here? Well, ignoring the two pi, the one over two pi is just looking this part, uh, this is exactly uh, know, something you might use to approximate a Riemann integral. Okay, it's a whole it's a whole sum of function values at regularly spaced intervals uh, multiplied by the width of that interval. Okay, the interval between different arguments we're evaluating here are exactly pi and L bar. And so you might hope, in some sense, that this converges uh, to leaving that one over two pi over the trunk uh, this interval to minus infinity to infinity of uh, the continuous version of this, which is uh, f hat xi squared xi. Okay? And so our first conjecture about the Fourier transform uh, is exactly that uh, if you look at this quantity, which is like the which is the analog of this guy, so one over two pi equal to negative infinity to infinity, norm squared of the Fourier transform. is equal to, well, this thing back, the L2 norm of the original function. Okay, so we have, certainly haven't proved that, but we'll, we'll do this. So what you might say here, well, what, what's happening here, that we're taking some function f and producing some new function f hat. So uh, curly f here is taking this something in L2R, and sending this to something in L2R, spinning out some new f hat that's, that's also there in L2R. Uh, and we can even say that preserves norms up to a factor of, uh, I guess it's 2 pi to the half. These are both norm L2 
normal square is. So you have to take the square root of t. And let's look at the <coughs> other formula here. Um, bit here is exactly the sort of thing you use to approximate a Riemann integral, okay, to sum the function values multiplied by the, uh, the width of the interval between the places where you're evaluating the function. So again, you might have that convergence to 1 over 2 pi, integral from negative infinity to infinity, e to the uh, i sine x f hat sine xi. The second conjecture is uh, if we define a curly G by this, well, by, by this formula, so curly G of x <coughs> at a point x is 1 over 2 pi, the integral from negative infinity to infinity, e to the i xi. So what happened over here? Well, this thing gave us back exactly the function we started with. So we might have that g of f of little f equals the function that we started with. Okay. So here, it's the same g is the inverse for it. We find these two operations, curly f, which took our function f and spat out this guy, and curly g, which took our function f and spat out this guy, and then hope that they're, they're inverse, <coughs> inverse <coughs> operators. Uh, okay. uh, what, just notice the differences between the two formulas. This one has a negative sign in the exponential rule, that one's got a plus sign, and the g has a 1 over 2 pi at the front. These two pi's are, are a real pain. There end up being three different conventions in the world. You can sort of shuffle that 2 pi around any way you like. You can either put it here and say the Fourier transform deserves to have a 1 over 2 pi in it, or you can put it here like we're doing and saying that the inverse Fourier transform deserves to have a 1 over 2 pi in it, or you can split the difference and put a square root to 1 over 2 pi in, on, in both of them. Um, and I think that you can, I think that you're meant to be able to tell the difference between like, a mathematician and a physicist and an engineer. Walk into a bar <laughs> by knowing where they put their two pies, but I wouldn't swear by that. Um, this is an unfortunate case where there are three different conventions. Mathematicians, physicists, and engineers use different ones, and the physicists and engineers aren't clearly wrong. I think there's just no good reason to put it anywhere. You just have to do it. So, so what's that? The Whenever you see it, what is one? Yeah, yeah, it's taking two pies. So this is where the Fourier transform doesn't have a two pi the inverse Fourier transform does. Okay. So okay, so we need to. That's all. That's all sort of motivation so far. Now we need to actually make it work. We need to see that the Fourier transform really does behave like that. Okay. Uh, <coughs> okay. So. Let's go back and, and get serious about, uh, about all of this. Uh, we haven't even talked about what sort of function f should be, little f should be in all of this. Uh, we haven't really worried about any sort of convergence issues. So our job now is to try and get that straight. So uh, to start things off, uh, let's define, uh, well, maybe let me say a little bit about what we're doing. So we're going to Fourier transform works in lots of places, and, and uh, the sort of f you, you stick in here, 
or it's a bit hard to decide exactly what you should say about it. What's, what's, what's a condition that makes this interval make sense for every side? So this quantity here is just a complex exponential. So it has not the first one, or it has not exactly one of those ones. So as long as f is in L1, this integral certainly converges. This integral certainly exists for every xi. Okay? So you might say, oh, Fourier transform is some operation that has a domain L1 and goes somewhere. The problem is it's extremely hard to describe, it's sort of actually in some sense impossible to describe, what the image of L1 is under Fourier transform. Like what functions do you get as Fourier transforms of L1 functions? Hard to say. So what we're going to end up doing is uh, what we're going for is, I guess, this setting here. We want to set up a uh, Fourier transform as a linear operator from L2 of R to L2 of R. And even that is going to take a bunch of work because if you look at this formula here, there's actually no reason why <coughs> you just know that f is L2, that this function should even, this integral should even converge. For a given value of xi, this might not be integral. Okay? So, we're going to have to do a, a bunch of fancy work, and we will end up with a linear operator from L2 to L2 called Fourier transform. But it's going to be a bit confusing. On the intersection of L1 and L2, it will be given by this formula. And the bits of L2 that aren't in L1 is going to be different, and we're going to have to explain all of that and how it works. Okay. So we're going to come to terms with all of this. The way we're going to start is we're going to start with an extremely simple class of extraordinarily nice function where everything is easy. Define Fourier transform of there and then see what we can get from that by abstract nonsense. And it's the Schwartz functions uh, that uh, are going to be the really nice functions where everything just works. So uh, I promise to forgive you if you promise to forgive me. But there are two different Schwartzes here, the Schwartz functions and the Schwartz and Cauchy Schwartz. This guy's got a T, the other one doesn't. But let's, uh, let's uh, cut each other some slack on that. Uh, I don't promise to put the cheese in my place. Okay, so, okay. so what, is a, what is a Schwartz function? Uh, Schwartz function. So, so f from uh, Rn to the complex numbers uh, is Schwartz. Or, uh, you might also see people say of rapid decrease. If, uh, yeah, so call alpha and beta, uh, something about it like this. So these are just n tuples of natural numbers, which you might call a multi index. You'll see how they get used in the formula. Uh, and then you take x to the alpha d to the beta of f at point x. So here, what do I mean? So here, uh, e.g., if uh, alpha is in the tuple 1, 2, beta is in the tuple 3, 4, this means uh, x times y squared some monomial, and this guy, uh, as we take the supremum over x to the power n, that's finite. <coughs> so let's just think a bit about what that says. So uh, ignoring uh, beta for a moment, this says, well, first of all, uh, it says x is bounded. That's the case when you take alpha equals zero as well. Okay, then 
the simplest of Hebrew event is, is finite. Um, in fact, f decays faster. And any polynomial, so that's saying, so again, it's still doing the bedding. If you take f of x and multiply it by any monomial, that's some function, I don't know, x to the 17 wider than 1 million, uh, it's still bounded, even if you multiply it by that monomial. And so, translated, that's saying it's, the function itself is decaying so fast, even if you multiply it by a big polynomial, it's still bounded at x goes to infinity. And then with beta, this is saying, uh, and All derivatives uh, exist, and also decay the stars. That is, they also all decay faster than anything else. Uh, maybe I'm sorry, I should have put it right at the beginning here. If uh, it's C infinity, and so we're, we're just assuming we're having to get rid of the Schwartz functions, so <coughs> infinitely differential. Bounded, they decay faster than polynomials and all the derivatives decay that fast as well. Now, of course, you basically will never ever meet a Schwartz function in the wild. This is a, 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 a pretty ridiculous condition. With a few very important exceptions. Um, let's uh, Let's give the main example, which we'll come, which we'll use again and again. Uh, uh, e to the negative x squared. Uh, let's just leave it like that. It's Schwartz. Okay. So this one's actually kind of relatively easy to to prove. What do you need to prove to do this? Well, it's only c infinity. You know how to differentiate this as many times as you like. Taking derivatives and multiplying by <coughs> monomials, in this case we're actually the same thing, okay? Taking the derivative of this guy just pulls out a factor of negative two x out the front. So it actually, taking the partial derivative and multiplying by a monomial are really the same operation. So to prove it's Schwartz, we just need to show that, uh, we just need to show x to k e to the minus x squared. It's going to be only Schwartz function you'll ever meet. Uh, in some sense. Okay, but we need a few facts about Schwartz functions until we use these exercises. So, which one is to be actually me? So, F. It's a famous class of functions, curly S. So, if F is a Schwartz function, Multiply by any monomial, it's still a Schwartz. And if you take any partial derivatives of it, then it's still Schwartz. Um, and the other one, is this one in the notes here. So if f is Schwartz, and g is smooth. Just to make clear what this statement is saying. So here, uh, f is smooth, and all of its derivatives are not only bounded, but decay faster than any polynomial. Okay? And g is just a function that's smooth, and all its derivatives are bounded. <coughs> so there's no requirement that they, that they decay faster in any sense, but they're not from Schwartz. So I'll leave those two points for you to profess to think about. They're not, they're not too hard. No.
before we get on to the, uh, the main theorems about this, we need one more fact. Say is here. So, say uh, so if we, if we have some Schwartz function, what we're about to talk about will be true for much more than Schwartz functions, but we're, we're just starting at the beginning to be conservative about it. Uh, you can Take the Fourier transform uh, of uh, rewrite this. Okay, so here I'm just taking the Fourier transform of some partial derivative of f. And I put some kind of pesky extra coefficient here. This minus i that maybe we can return to. Just don't worry about that. So this, of course, is now some function of the xi variables. Okay, so here, here x is in our n, uh, xi is also in our n. And what is this? Well, the, the claim is that this is actually just xi j times the Fourier transform of a evaluated xi. Okay, so this is saying that you either take your function and differentiate it, and then take its Fourier transform, Alternatively, you could take the Fourier transform of the function and then multiply by by one by the corresponding coordinate. Okay. Uh, and in the other direction, uh, if you take the Fourier transform of x j times f, such your function multiplied by one of the coordinate variables, uh, that's the same as taking the uh, i times e by. by dealing with multiplication by a polynomial. And differentiation. Now, this is going to be a uh, sort of a, a great technical tool in everything we prove, uh, but it's also um, it's also you know, conceptually in a few different ways. Um, what's it to say about it? Um, yeah, uh, I think it's a bit of a actually. Yeah, uh, let's, let's give ourselves just a little bit more notation. Let's just write dj, capital dj, to be this funny guy here. Okay, with the minus i. So we can rewrite these as f dj f equals uh, xi j. somewhere because you can see like the, the left hand side has an eye and the right hand side doesn't so you've got to put it somewhere but the reason for putting it in the differentiation operator here is that uh, with appropriate uh, uh, domain range uh, the partial derivative operator uh, is not self adjoint but i times Partial differentiation. Partial differentiation. Yeah. Partial differentiation. 
deviation of red is so little. And the basic idea is that if you're looking at sort of the integral of f d dx g, <coughs> what would you hope from the adjoint? Well, you'd be asking, is that equal to the integral of d dx of f times g? Okay. Remember that this is exactly what uh, integration by parts doesn't say. <laughs> integration by parts says that uh, this is actually equal to f times g minus that guy. Okay? Maybe f times g evaluated at appropriate points. But if we hope that that part goes to zero because our domain range of functions vanish to infinity or something like that, this is exactly, this formula is exactly the same. The part of differentiation is anti self You pick up a minus sign. So when you put in the factor of i, uh, that exactly fixes that minus sign because uh, secretly there's a secretly there's a bar there or something. And if you put an i in there, it would pop out a minus sign. So that's that's just an aside about why we like that part of differentiation and that. Okay. Um, Great. So let's do at least one of these. Um, we just need to grab the formula again for the transform. Look at that. So at some point without telling you guys for working on R to working on RE. Uh, hopefully it didn't scare you too badly. When we wrote the formulas of the Fourier transform before, I guess I X times Xi, because I was working on R, and now I'm implicitly working on RE, where I have time to reduce all these multi-indices and different variables and so on, and the appropriate thing to do is to take X dot Xi. I should have been clear about that before. Uh, X times F of X, uh, and then of course times uh, D by X. Now, remember we're assuming here that f is um, Schwartz, okay? We can particularly dictate an infinity really nicely, so we can use integration by parts. And we don't have to worry about the boundary term because f, f vanishes in infinity, and we get exactly uh, minus integral from negative infinity. Well, sorry, I'm being totally hopeless here. Uh, I should write r in. Instead of minus infinity to infinity, R n. Uh, and now the differentiation pops over the other term. Right. <coughs> ah, of course, I left out the minus i there. Right there. Uh, and now this could just. What is this? Well, I mean, x dot xi, of course, is uh, x1 xi1 plus x2 xi2, so on. So when you differentiate with respect to xj, most of the terms up in the exponent here, just, we don't see it all, but we think we do see the one that's got a, an xj in it. And so we pull it down out here exactly in a minus i uh, xij. And then the exponential stays there. Now this is just a constant with respect to the variable we're integrating over, and so we get exactly z and j times the integral. And that's perfectly exactly what we 
tiny difference a moment ago. It's just xi j times the, the Fourier transform. Great. Okay. In this one. <coughs> So let's now see that we've sort of set up everything we need to set up about very basic properties of Fourier transform and choice functions, and we can actually try and prove our, our theorems now. So here's a so Fourier transform x choice functions to choice functions. Functions, script G, the inverse Fourier transform, is a two sided inverse to Fourier transform. So, in particular, I guess we're claiming here, although maybe it's sort of obvious almost from here, that G also takes Schwartz functions <coughs> to Schwartz functions. And then finally, uh, Fourier transform uh, almost preserves norms. So, thinking about it. Sorry, question. Oh, yeah. Would you like to slide it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So, this just means that uh, f of g of f is equal to the original Schwartz function we started with, and similarly g of f. Okay. So, the proof of these guys uh, is going to take a little while. Um, well, I guess the first one is actually pretty easy. The, the choice, so these two will definitely wait till Wednesday. I guess in the remaining five or seven minutes, we can either prove this one, <coughs> or I can explain the idea of how you use these facts here to boost for a transform up to an operator from L2 of R to L2 of R. The latter. The latter? Okay. Good. We'll come back. That means we, we're. Uh, Putting off the technical details <laughs> another day. That's okay. It'd be here, right? My strike camera. You won't have to learn the technical details. Okay. So, uh, so, how does this go? So, uh, so step one. Uh, Choice functions are dense in L2 of Rn. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll prove this as well because it barely takes more effort. They are dense in L Rn uh, for any finite p. And th this is sort of a, just a generally useful fact to know. Um, it's nice to have really nice functions that are dense in the dense and big functions. Okay, so we're going to have to prove that. It's more technical detail because we've been traveling. Uh, but then, uh, step two. Um, the bounded linear operator on uh, S inside H. So this is, this is meant to be a different S now. It's not necessarily Schwartz. It's just um, some so let me use a different one. Let's use curly D. Okay. So, um, and let's say, let's just write dense underneath there. So we've got some dense set in H. Okay. So we've got some bounded linear operator uh, on D. So, uh, so let me say this a little more. 
the same. Uh, D is dense in some open space H. And T maps D to possibly some other open space. In our case, it's other open space is going to be the same one we started with. Is bounded. Then uh, T extends uniquely. Oh, uh, sorry, it is bounded. Uh, yeah, that's what we Sorry, then T extends uniquely. To a bounded linear operator. And in fact, it has the same bound as the original D. Okay. And so the, um, the proof of this is, of course, pretty easy. So um, uh, let's call this guy T hat, the extended guy. So given uh, F in the open space, what you do, you define T hat of F by just picking a sequence Gn dense subspace. So Gn converges to F. And defining So how do we know, uh, let's see, what do we need to know? Um, <coughs> so certainly because D is dense, we can pick some sequence here. Okay. We need to make sure that this makes sense, that is, this limit even exists. So why does that limit even exist? Yeah, so forget for a moment that GN converges to F. Uh, I mean, because f isn't in where t is defined, but gn itself is just some Cauchy sequence. Because t is now in tgn, it's still some Cauchy sequence. So when h prime, it has some. So we make that definition there. Okay, so then you've got a few things to check. Uh, the really important one that maybe is easy to miss, t does t hat, doesn't depend. the choice of approximating sequence GN. Because you might pick some different agent that approximates F. I'm trying to find T hat using the limit of T agents. I'm actually checking we get the, right, the same answer. And I don't know if you guys have seen the trick before, but <coughs> the way to do this is you get two different sequences GN agent that you were working with here. You can think about interspersing them, interleaving the two sequences. And what you can see is actually the limit of the T GNs must be the same as the limit of the T GH, 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 GHs, and that must be the same as the, as the limit of the THs. Okay, so this limit here doesn't depend on which sequence you use by an argument like that. Uh, and maybe some slightly cheaper things, you need to check that T hat is linear. Okay? But once you've checked independence of the choice, this is pretty easy. You can look at T hat of x plus y, you just pick an approximating sequence for x, use an approximating sequence for y and use the sum of those two sequences, the approximating sequence with plus y, and so on, and t hat is bounded. Okay. So that, most of that is sort of easy formal nonsense. But you can see now, hopefully, that this puts everything together for us. So from this fact, and this is certainly showing us that f is bounded, and much better than showing that f is bounded, it tells us to preserve the norms after a factor, but certainly this gives us a bound on f. This tells us so Fourier transform extends uniquely to a bound linear map L2 of R and to L2 of R. But it's sort of a, uh, this is what I was, something I was talking about maybe just 10 minutes ago. It's a sort of funny definition. Uh, you can think of this if your function were doing is actually in L1, uh, you, can, you, you can think that Fourier transform is just using the normal formula that we've broken down somewhere on the board for what Fourier transform does. 
But for a general function here, really you've got to think, oh, what this means, what f of f means is by definition, this is the limit of f of g, and you've got to some approximating sequence of Cauchy, oh, not Cauchy, uh, other guy, Schwartz functions, <laughs> uh, to f, and take it there for your transform. And then take this pointwise limit of the Fourier transforms of the Schwartz function, the Fe functions. So it becomes a theorem, which we'll have to prove later, uh, that, I mean, this is that, that on the L1 intersect L2, these two formulas, this formula and the, act, the honest formula by an integral, actually get written. <laughs> it's an easy theorem, but it's sort of conceptually kind of weird. Fundamentally, we know how to take the Fourier transforms of Schwartz functions, that works really well. And the Fourier transform will be on two functions in the final form. Okay, so we still need to prove theorem 1, 2, 3 in step 1, and that will occupy, I guess, most of the rest of the week. Maybe, maybe we can get most of it done. Not much. Okay, let's take a five minute break, go to the toilet, get a drink, whatever you like, and we'll come back, talk about some combinations of the problem we said, uh, the assignment, and Whatever we're probably wrong with for today. Um, the, remember, the assignment is due next Friday, but remember, the second assignment is only due two weeks after that, or three weeks after that, or something. Not long after the first one. So like, be aware of the second assignment already. Uh, don't get stuck after the first assignment's due, the third assignment's due, the second.